Recording in progress. Uh, we welcome go. to Conversations with Calvin Weeder Species. Uh, and and uh, I'm with Robert Brill from Brill Media. And, and uh, I have been looking forward to this. My fists are clenched. Uh, and that's a sign uh, of exuberance. <laughs> uh, I, I, my fists are clenched because uh, Robert Brill uh, is, is a master marketer, advertiser in Brill Media. We're going to talk about Brill Media. And at the very end of this, uh, we're going to deal with Calvin, uh, a self-published author who would like to sell some books. And uh, 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 and I've come to Robert on the side, have nothing to do with this interview, to help me sell books. Because I, I got a great novel. I, I don't mind promoting it. Uh, there's a tortoise in my hair. It got a great Kirkus review. It got a Kirkus star. That puts me in the same league as, as the help and the kite runner. So uh, this is real valid. It's a great read. They loved it. They compared me to John Irving. So we got to find out how to sell it. But more importantly, now we're going to talk to to Robert. Uh, and I have a Dodger fan. Um, yes. See, I, you won't hold it against me. <laughs> no, I, no. Listen, I, I I I was a Dodger fan uh, <laughs> most of my life. I grew up with you know yeah. Koufax and Drysdale and and and. Uh, I mean, John Roseborough, I mean, all these names, Carl Erskine, you know, all the, you know, that was Dodgers were my life, Carl Ferrillo. I mean, before your time. Yeah. Duke Snyder, uh, Jackie Robinson. I mean, uh, and part of my being a Dodger fan, you know, Jackie Robinson, Dodgers, you know, broke that barrier and, yeah. and just kind of moved me, even though I was a young kid. So uh, enough with my Johnny Carson monologue. Uh, Robert, let's uh, jump into you. Uh, and and how about a little background, a little history, California State and stuff, and, and then we'll yeah. talk about real media and marketing. Thanks for having me, Calvin. I really appreciate it. Um, let's see. I've uh, I've worked in advertising for 20 years. For the last 10 years, I've been bootstrapping Brill Media, and our job is to run advertising for clients uh, to generate leads and sales. So we're running lots of ads, millions of dollars of ads in Meta and Google and um, Hulu, Roku, and if it's digital advertising, we do it. And um, a lot of our clients end up being agencies that want uh, want help with their ad buying and don't do it themselves. And so a lot of times we're a, an outsourced white label partner for those types of companies. And yeah, I live in Los Angeles, avid Dodgers fan, married, have a five-year-old boy. Great. My life. That's great. Hey, Great, great, great. I had a five-year-old boy you know, 33 years ago. Now he has a, a two-year-old boy. Yeah. That's the, best. the circle of life. Um, mm -hmm. Right away, just throw out some, uh, as I've been doing my research, you know, Brill, Brill Media has gotten some great, great honors. Just some some of the honors that you've kind of accumulated. Yeah. So um Across the Inc. 5000 and Financial Times 500, we've been honored on those lists a total of 10 times. Wow. And um, those are recognitions of the hard work our team does, the faith and trust that our clients have in our business, and our ability to grow businesses um, using digital advertising. Okay. Um, in my reading, there's a, there's a process of moving from employee to entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, Describe that and your your yeah. role in in that process. Yeah, I mean, um, twenty thirteen, I was a, uh, you know, I was in a position where I, I worked for this company. I thought I was going to retire from that company, um, went bankrupt, and I was really, like, sad because I really enjoy working in the advertising business, and I didn't, but I didn't want to start out again, um, working for another agency, rebuilding the cachet and the the authority that I had inside that one agency. I didn't want to rebuild that. So I said, okay, if I'm going to do all that again, we have to rebuild something from scratch. I am going to do it for myself instead of another company. And so that's what I did. But the, the journey was far from smooth. You know, a lot of the, you know, the very first moment was I realized I needed to now sell, talk about our goods and services so that we know how to um, generate income. And, and I realized I didn't know how to sell. 
Uh, the second sort of big barrier was that there were there are in advertising when you're when you're buying advertising space to reach people, uh, you have to front money a lot of times. So you know when, if we got a hundred thousand dollar advertising campaign, I didn't have a hundred thousand dollars to put into Meta or Google or another platform and then wait 30, 60, 90 days to get it back. So just realizing those challenges kind of overwhelmed me. And uh, I then took a full time job right out of college. I mean, sorry, right out of um, right. Like I started my business for three months. I had it. And then I took a full time job. So as a result, um, I, I took about a year and two months to marinate on how I'm going to sort of move forward with my business. And I realized that I really wanted to, like, I really had to scratch that itch. I have uh, what Napoleon Hill calls the burning desire to figure it out. And that's after that year hiatus of working for another company, that's when I realized that I need to go all in on this business. It wasn't easy because the next step was I had to actually figure out how to generate revenue. And I realized that um, I didn't want to, I tried everything I could to not do the thing I was best at, which is ad buying. So for the, past prior 10 years, I knew how to do ad buying. I worked on corporate accounts, including uh, Sony and uh, Disney and Capcom and Toshiba, Bacardi, PetSmart, et cetera, Northrop Grumman. So I knew how these massive organizations, uh, in fact, ConocoPhillips was Fortune 4 when I was working on them in like 2012 or something like that. And I knew how these large corporations wielded money to buy advertising to generate more sales. And and I thought that's a big opportunity, but the challenge fundamentally is that it's I felt like a really small fish in a really big pond. Um, so I tried other things. I tried to do social marketing. I tried to be an influencer, which I had no business being. I tried, to, yeah, it's a silly, <laughs> silly story. Um, I tried to create an influencer marketing firm. I tried to do a social media marketing firm. All these things that were around the marketing world, but not exactly what I knew how to do the best. But the minute I really focused in on ad buying, which is my zone of genius, that's when I really had the opportunity to strike out, generate some positive momentum and uh, really start to grow the business. In my doing my due diligence as a journalist, uh, there was a couple of buzzwords that kept popping up. Uh, if you could talk about it, um, mindset, mm -hmm. motivation, and and how does that pertain to someone even like me, you know, who's looking for advertising help? Mindset, motivation. Yeah. So Carol Dweck in the nineteen seventies, I believe. Um, uh, came up with, you know, did research as a psychologist or, you know, a really smart person with a degree and whatnot. And she um, she coined this phrase around mindset, which is there's two kind of like types of mindset in general. Uh, there's a fixed mindset and then there's the growth mindset. And the fixed mindset is sounds like this. Like, I know my limitations and I'm going to work within my limitations. And uh, the world is happening and I'm going to just do my best to fit in. Um, the growth mindset is I'm a continuous learner. Um, there are going to be challenges and I'm going to learn from those challenges. And so what I realized over time, I just learned about Carol Dweck, like in the last two months. Um, but I understood what I, one of the key things that helped me become more effective at the work I'm doing is understanding that there's something called mindset. And you can either look at every opera, everything that's happening in a, positive way or a negative way. Every failure is an opportunity to learn. That's the growth mindset. The fixed mindset is every failure is recognition of how bad I am. <laughs> right? So um, I, I chose, I start, I, I, I started to pay attention to these things because, you know, the entrepreneurial journey um, is, is, is challenging. It's, it's rife with failure. It's just failure every day. And every now and again, you'll have a point of success. And then, you know, it's being okay with all the points of failure so that you can achieve that success and understanding that the failure is your ability to build muscle that allows you to become better and achieve the success you're looking for. I 
working for a decade was, you know, about not, taking less risk. I, you know, I grew up, my, my parents are uh, Eastern European. They met here. So there is that, you know, perspective, like you just work hard, you work at a company and, you know, things will be good and it's less, less risky. Meanwhile, companies go bankrupt. People get laid off, you know, things change routinely and you start to realize, or I started to realize it's not as risk averse as it's made out to be, especially when you have to jump, jump jobs every few years for some reason, especially in the sales profession. I wasn't, I've never ha held a sales role other than CEO, which is a sales role fundamentally, but salespeople notoriously have to move jobs every 18 to 24 months. That's just, that's just the nature of the game, at least in the advertising business. And I was like, okay, if I'm, if I'm going to, if I if I am if I am to understand that this in this environment is far more risky than I thought it was, then I'm going to operate in this risky environment, doing things that will give me the absolute biggest benefit, which is starting my business, rather than, as you know, as we were talking about at the time, building someone else's dreams. You work for someone else, you build someone else's dreams. I felt it was time to go out on my own, and even the idea of of really understanding that I could, or I should, or I should even consider going out on my own was like a two year formulation process in and of itself. So mindset is the thing that allows for all the negative stuff that happens in a business or as you're growing a company or as you're hitting roadblocks to be perceived as a, as a good thing rather than a bad thing. Okay. Um, Talk about like specific, uh, this is kind of vague, uh, specific advertising tactics to grow business and and uh, how does one find the best marketing partner? Yeah. And so what is, what's effective in that? So the first thing, when you, when you want to find an advertising partner, you need to find someone who has wrinkles, probably. That's right. Wrinkles equals experience. And I um, like that uh, wrinkle. I'm writing it down. I like that. Wrinkles equals experience. Yes. You look, every, the 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 challenge for any business owner is that literally anyone there's no very there's there's no substantial barrier to entry to start a marketing firm. All you need is a computer, an internet connection, and a Facebook account. You can you can sell Facebook ads. There's no barrier to entry there. So then the question is, how do you find someone that's going to be honest with you, who's going to give you context, who's going to give you learnings, and who's ultimately going to grow your business? And so what we sell against, what we do is this framework of context, communication, and consistency. Number one, you have to be open to avail yourself to client needs and communications. Uh, number two, that has to happen consistently. Like you can't just go off the grid for three weeks and expect everything to be fine. And number four, I think the most important one is context. It's really when things are happening in a marketing campaign, why are they happening? There's what's happening, which is important, but also why is it happening? So when you're generating sales, why are you generating sales? What is the catalyst for those sales? If you're not generating sales, what's the catalyst for not generating sales? What are we missing? And a lot of that, a lot of the why can only be um, ascertained from people who have, who have been through the ringer a few times and have um, probably have wrinkles on their face because they understand uh, they they've seen they've seen the things they've done the things they know a thing or two about a thing or two which is from that car insurance commercial um i think it was allstate maybe i don't know um and right so so you really want people that that can provide an understanding of, of how things are going with your marketing campaign so when you think about marketing and advertising most companies offer like we're going to generate leads and sales, but they don't think about the insights that are being generated out of those campaigns because advertising in particular is a real-time focus group. If you want to understand what your company, what your customers are looking for, and you want to understand what they want from your business, you want to look at advertising as real-time focus group and it can tell you. So there's a creative testing framework that we deploy on Meta which outputs the following. It trains Meta's machine learning algorithm to find your best customers. That's mm -hmm. number one. Wow. Number two, 
It tells you which products, services, offers, discounts, and even audiences that resonate for your business. So in addition to driving sales forward, you also get to learn more about your business so you can go to market more effectively. And what that means in practice is if you're selling four products, but you're getting most of your sales from like one of your products, then maybe it's time to not focus on the other three that are like hindering your business and focus just on the one that is really your your zone of genius, what you know how to do really well or what customers perceive that to be. So advertising, good advertising and marketing firms will be the 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 stewards or the Sherpas or the the people who are gonna who are gonna give you the pathway help you make good decisions with your advertising investment. Because here's the thing, and this is relevant to our conversation earlier, you don't need likes, comments, and shares. You need sales. Like if you're optimizing your campaigns to likes, comments, and shares, is there a strategy behind that? Is there a reason why you need likes, comments, and shares? Too many businesses you know, there's 10 million businesses on Meta and about 64% of them, according to Neil Patel, just really, really fail at their marketing. And that's because they're op one of the key reasons is they're optimizing to the wrong metric. A lot of businesses accept that they're going to run ads and get likes, comments, and shares. Very few businesses, especially the ones that don't work with, a, with an expert marketing team, will even get to the realization that marketing and advertising should generate actual sales. And don't be satisfied with likes, comments, and shares or engagement because you can't pay the bills with that. Just thinking, uh, there's not a supermarket uh, anywhere in the United States that that will allow you to buy a loaf of white bread. Um, right. And comments and shares. Right. Doesn't exist. We talked about that before we went on air. Um, yeah. And um, interesting. Okay. Um, uh, there's a new and changing world of social media uh, and marketing, uh, and I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm flabbergasted because I'm an old timer. I'm a septuagenarian, and and I admit it, and I can't hide it because it, it's, you know, it kind of sneaks out. I am a septuagenarian, a little bit more advanced, maybe, but um, uh, 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 a, a crazy, a crazy silly video on TikTok, a million views. Uh, wow. Uh, and, and is somebody making money on that too? Yeah. I mean, if you're getting a million views on a TikTok video, there's a few ways to monetize. Number one, you can, uh, get paid when, uh, when you create high, a consistent high volume, uh, view count ads, uh, I'm sorry, uh, content on TikTok, they'll pay you for that. Um, I think far more relevant and appealing is going to be using that, influence to generate sales for a business or product or service. So B2B services would be particularly relevant there. And then, you know, you can do affiliate stuff where you talk about something, you put a link in your bio, or you talk about a website and you get paid every time someone buys from that website. Uh, off topic, uh, TikTok a little shaky these days. Uh, their I, future. I think, talk, I think, you know, I, I can't predict the future, but I think TikTok will be fine. Um, what's interesting about the bill, um, what's interesting about the bill is that it 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 makes it such that any company that is under the influence of any foreign power um, in any capacity could have the could opens itself up to the possibility that the government somehow like takes control of the the app. So, like for example making it up like X. If X is somehow, if X is somehow uh, under the influence of control by an adversary, specifically an adversary, not just any company, an adversarial company, uh, an adversarial um, state entity, a nation, then like, like if 20% of, of X is owned by some person that is a, is a national of an adversarial country, that opens up the possibility that X might be have uh, somehow be um, yeah. be be uh, under. Uh, sorry, the phrasing escapes. Yeah, me. Uh, under you know under a foreign umbrella kind of thing. Uh, yes, exactly. Like they be, because of that, then they then they might have uh, additional oversight of the company. 
including I, I, the possibility of divestiture, which is what's happening in Congress right now. Okay. Uh, I mean, I remember uh, Rupert Murdoch, and, and uh, I know they just kind of slapped his hands with all his media and, and what he was allowed to do and what he, I mean, that's, that was a bunch of years ago. Um, before I move on, I always like to ask this question, uh, take a deep breath, do a little inhalation uh, and go off topic. I, I like this uh, question. Uh, um, uh, here it goes. Excluding family or friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to answer, but it's cute. Uh, excluding family or friends, somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with. I think it would be Obama. Great. He's smart. He knows yeah. what's going on. He's well spoken. He's a he's a great communicator. Yeah. Uh, I I I and I, it's funny. I I'm, I'm I'm a big fan of Michelle too. Uh, um, and I met her brother. Uh, he yeah. He used to be a um, uh, he used to be a uh, uh, announcer for the Big Ten Network. And you know I'm a Rutgers guy. Yeah. So he was doing uh, he was doing color commentary for Big Ten games. So uh, Craig Robinson. So after one game, I, I kind of went over to him and there was nobody left in the arena. I hang around and got a chance to, to chat with him. Really friendly guy, great guy. But Obama, uh, I marvel at him. Right. And, and I, of course, I marvel at, at politics and, and, and the red and the blue. And 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 uh, But I, I just thought he was off the charts. You're right. Great, unbelievable communicator. I mean, just so incredible. Yep. Uh, I know, agree. Going going back to the TikTok thing, I think what's going to end. I think there's too much money at play here. There are investors across the world, including in the United States, that you know TikTok it will will be divest, divested if if this bill passes the Senate and a final bill can be agreed upon and goes to the president. And if the president signs it, I think that will force um, ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, to sell. TikTok because there's just too much money involved for it to just go away. Right. right. Yeah. So I'm not worried. I, I, you know, I'm going to promote our interview on, on TikTok and my little yeah. microcosmic world. Um, I'm, I'm trying, you know, it's a I'm great trying. platform. Yep. Uh, moving on. Uh, uh, let's talk about AI. When I do a lot of interviews with people in the AI realm, I use AI uh, almost every day to, to answer questions, you know, should it, you know, is there a sale on white bread at some supermarket today? You know, silly, but I, I use it. So uh, how is it uh, uh, AI entering your, your realm? Uh, are, are you cautious, worried about AI? Um, yeah, so I'm not worried and I'm not cautious. Um, I'm actually very bullish on the possibility that AI creates. So um, AI, we look at as an accelerator, uh, an accelerator tool. It helps us and our team um, produce more and better results faster. So, for example, we um, so very soon after ChatGPT announced that OpenAI was creating chat agents that you can using natural language conversations create a chat agent to do a specific thing. So, we created a copywriting tool. So, it helps us create language based off of what the advertiser actually needs in the market right now, based off of how the advertiser talks about itself on its website, based off of the ad specs that are necessary for Google and Meta and other platforms, and also based off of the most proven copywriting um, uh, frameworks that exist and have existed for the last 60, 70, 100 years. And so we use that tool to generate lots of great content we curate it, and then that content gets pushed out as ads. Then, of course, we optimize and we make changes right. and we iterate on that process. But it allows us to pass on the savings to our clients. It allows us to keep more of the revenue on uh, that's being developed on copy. And it allows us to feed the, al the, ad the advertising algorithms because what they really want is lots of ad variations so that they can figure out which ad variations are the most interesting and relevant to audiences. Like the key thing to know about advertising in 2024 is you don't just create one or two ads and like leave them on for six months. Every month you have to create at least five ads, which you then disassemble and 
reconnect in all possible variations. So five ads on Meta, each ad contains three different elements, a headline at the bottom, image or video in the middle, and primary text at the top. So when you reconstitute five different ads with three different variables, you get 125 possible ad variations. Wow. And as a result of that, you then get to test every month which one ad out of 125 is the most interesting. It's better to do that with, with AI. If you have the framework already, AI accelerates that work. Wow. So we're very interested in using AI. And here's here's what I'll say. Like there's a, uh, so I listened to the All In podcast with some venture capitalists and um, what they're saying is that Sam Altman has a, uh, Sam Altman, who's a, like the, the chairman, the creator, et cetera, of uh, OpenAI, um, he has a, a running, uh, he has a WhatsApp private chat group where he's taking uh, friendly bets on when the first company will be created that is a billion dollar company with one employee powered by AI. So think about that. They believe this will happen. Wow. They think this is going to happen. So everyone listening, if you have any capacity to take ownership of how you work, I don't care if you're a lawyer, a doctor, an entrepreneur, an employee, you can have an army of GPTs, chat agents, making you 50 times more effective, better, have, have different types of experience. Yeah. Wow. So that's what I'm trying to create in, in our business. Wow. Imagine that one person with a bill. It, it's a wow. I, I marvel at uh, Sam Altman. I marvel at the day he was fired. And I marvel at the next day uh, he's rehired and they got rid of 300 uh, people who, and it was all about the the 300 people who got, got axed. Uh, yeah. They wanted to do it for the sake of, of, of good and not have it as a profit incentive. And Sam Alton right. wanted profit incentive and he won. And that's, yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. I, I I do a lot of interviews with with AI, and and, and uh, we were chatting uh, with this philosophy professor, professor from Vancouver, and and he said that uh, uh, AI will dwarf fossil fuels in in into the trillions when it gets rolling along, and and I always get a little bit nervous because one of my favorite movies was two thousand and one. It came out oh, yeah. in the sixties. You know, uh, and I don't think it gets enough credit, but I mean, yeah. that's AI all over the place when Hal wanted to take over the, the spaceship. I mean, right. my goodness. So th this stuff we're doing now that, that dealt with 50, you know, Arthur Clarke, brilliant, brilliant, right? Yeah, there's a direct line there. Yeah, yeah really. Wow. And, and and not much is not much is uh, changed. And, and I saw something last night, uh, you know, uh, I, I didn't finish reading it about uh the Wizard of Oz, and and, and did they uh, hint uh, about cell phones? It's, it's crazy stuff. But anyway, it, the whole AI thing just fascinates me, and it it does worry, uh, it it does worry me. But it's too late. Um, you got to go with the flow. Okay, moving along. Um, there there is so much data. Uh, data is so critical uh, for you. Data is everywhere. Uh, I worry about Big Brother. Uh, uh, I worry about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an anti-Orwellian and I worry about Big Brother. I know that uh, when uh, if I'm watching a movie and, and I, I go to uh, Google uh, to Google the movie, and I just type the first name of an actor. You know, I just type uh, uh, Robert uh, and, and it'll actually spit out the last name like it knew what I was doing. Scary stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, and that's data. So uh, talk about data. And yeah, I mean, it depends on who you are, right? Like everyone, everyone is kind of like emitting data fumes that indicate what we're interested in, like who we are. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. Pleasure. I have to turn off the air conditioning. So these data fumes are emitting information about who we are, what we're interested in, where we're going, uh, what we're searching for, what our preferences and interests are, whether or not we buy Oreos at the supermarket, where we plan on traveling. So, I mean, that's the nature of our current world. And there are companies who 
collect all that data, uh, analyze it, package it up and sell it to companies like mine so that we can deliver ads in a more effective way. Now, the prevailing sort of trend across many democracies is less data tracking and more privacy. And so as a result, you're seeing companies like Meta and Google um, take on the role of protecting its data so it's not so uh, easily available to marketers like our clients, which then results in opaque advertising solutions. So an example of that is in Meta, when we target ads, we're targeting ads by uh, age, gender, and location. And when we're doing that, it's because you know inside Meta, for example, there's a lot more granular targeting. There's keyword targeting and interest targeting, lookalike targeting and remarketing. But really, at the end of the day, what Meta wants you to do is target broad. So age, gender, and location. If you're a restaurant and you run ads five miles around your address, I'm sorry, if you're a restaurant and people will buy, will walk in or drive maximum five miles, then there's no point in running ads 20 miles away because they're not going to ever come to you. For us, B2B, we serve companies all across the United States. So our broad targeting is across the United States. Now, I could target CMOs and fractional CMOs and marketing agencies, et cetera. But what Meta wants you to do is go broad, leave all that granular data targeting behind, and let its algorithm route your ad message to the right people at the right time. So it's really important to understand the current moment, whatever the current moment is, and how these platforms want to be used. And like Meta published something, they called it the the Performance 5, like how they want Meta to, Meta small businesses to advertise on Meta. So, you know, our job is definitely to use data and data comes in a lot of different ways and also to use the best best practices to grow businesses. When you're also talking about data, there's a lot of granularity and it and I, I talk I go back to what I said earlier, which is data can also in, inform insights about a business. And that's gonna be very powerful. And a lot of marketers don't realize how much data there is that can actually help them. It's basically bit free business intelligence data if they just know where to look and how to read it. Um by the way, in in, in, uh, in my discovery process and learning about uh, when we first kind of just chatted and zoomed to get acquainted, uh, I really like the fact that that Drill Media um, provides uh, access to small business, and, and I've had some experience with with companies that were at the verge of doing some amazing things, but excluded the whole notion of small business. I'm a small business of sorts, but I, I like that that you're open to that 100 percent. i mean small businesses and mid-sized businesses doesn't mean small money it just means not multi-billion dollar multinational everything under that is like you know small and mid-sized business and you know, there's there's so much power in that contingent of people that we want to really power them and, and we're one of those companies ourselves okay. um as we wind down um uh you have a campaign. Uh, how how long? What are what are the expectations where you begin to see results? And that'll segue into my last question. Yeah, I I look at stuff around three months. Okay. Um, doesn't mean doesn't mean it'll take three months to get results. It just means to really start to see the full benefit. You want to wait at least three months and run the campaigns. You want to give the algorithms time to kind of understand who your customers are okay. with data from pixels. Um, you want time for our ad buyers to make optimizations to kind of fully wield it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you should, three months is a good time period to assess performance. Okay. Now, the question that I've been dying to ask. Yes. Uh, so uh, I'm Calvin and, and I'm a self-published uh, uh, author and an indie uh, author. Uh, uh, and, and for all the other 200,000, self-published indie authors out there every year like myself uh i'm coming to you to sell my novel there's a tortoise in my hair um what are the steps what can we do what should be done 
Uh, yeah. The, the most, the lowest hanging fruit, the most easily accessible platforms for you are going to be number one, determining where you're going to sell the product. Are you going to do it through Shopify and ship it yourself? It, will it be through Amazon? So in your case, Amazon. So the most direct path to success is going to be making your Amazon sales page good, like optimizing it. And then it's going to be running ads on Amazon to get people to buy your, your, your book. Like right. it's that simple. There are other things you can do outside of that, certainly. But I think especially when you're just starting out and you're looking to achieve product market fit where you can, you know how to communicate so that people buy stuff from you, you need to achieve sales. The, the most likely place that a sale is going to come from is the platform that is selling your book. And that in this case, it's going to be Amazon. Right. Uh, one silly question. We're, we're, we're kind of done with the basics. Although I, I could sit here and talk to you for at least another hour. You don't have an hour. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you and I might have a chance to meet uh, because you're an Inter Miami fan, correct? Yes, I am. And 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 uh, in a short period of time, uh, the World Cup is going to be here. That's right, in New Jersey. So yeah. So uh, I'm right down the road. We'll we'll talk about that in in time. But anyway, yes. uh, uh, Robert, this was great. Uh, uh, truly great. You you you've been gracious and and you've filled my head. I took some notes. Uh, yeah. But this is this is life. It's so vital. It's vital yeah. for me uh, as an indie author to to get this message out there. So I, I can't thank you enough, you know, for being here and 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 I'm now officially welcome you to come back. Uh, awesome. Come back. We can do more of these and panels. Any because uh, people need to know, and it's so much in my world with my other two hundred thousand indie authors out there. I know the ninety nine point nine percent of them have no clue how yeah. to go forth. So maybe we're doing a good deed here. I hope so. Yep. But thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording. Come back. Thanks, this is great. Go Dodgers. Go Dodgers. Go Dodgers. Uh, and to be continued. Thank you, Robert. Don't leave.